accused of targeting opponents living in exile, allegations it's always denied. How should the international community respond to this? Rwanda today stands at, um, at crossroads in the way every nation does, uh, because every Rwandan knows, and most people who may be acquainted with modern Rwanda will tell you, there's no freedom of expression. If, for example, I try to give this interview in Rwanda, I would be in jail that same evening or that same morning, or I would be dead unless I figure out how to run out of the country. I'm Dr. Tell General Dasingwa, and I come from Rwanda. I'm a citizen of of Rwanda and I've lived in this country for almost 20 years if I combine my presence here in the last 17 years and the three plus years I lived here as an ambassador of Rwanda to the United States after the tragic uh, events of 1994. I was born in Rwanda but I never actually lived in Rwanda for a long long time. In fact for most of my lifetime I've lived as, as a refugee, that the lives of individuals and the lives of families in Rwanda are very much intertwined with the story, the greater story of, uh, of the country. And it's in these refugee camps of, uh, of Uganda that uh, my mother taught me how to read and write, even though herself she had never been to school. And having grown up as a refugee, I was kind of driven like so many other young people of my age and my time to do something about it because we felt that being a refugee is not the natural condition of, of human beings. Growing up in a refugee camp itself is a lesson of teaching you that that is not where you belong. When you're young you don't ask yourself about all these things but I was growing up I was asking my mother because my father had perished in the troubles of uh, the Hutu revolution and so we would ask why are we here? Why are we in the refugee camp? So as you grow older, you become a little more conscious about the fact that you actually do not belong to the country where you are a refugee and that you are uh, in exile. And so that in itself, by the time I went to college, was a very persistent voice in me that, and in others that constantly told us that this is not where we belong. And so that in itself was what drew me to uh, the invasion of Rwanda from Uganda in 1990. So for most of my young adult life and little and up to now, I've been always also inclined to figure out how to use peaceful means between nations, even among nations, how to solve the problems that uh, uh, nations and societies find themselves involved in. So I worked as a diplomat and uh, in 1996, I was appointed my country's ambassador to the United States. I returned to Rwanda to become uh, the chief of staff of the current president of Rwanda, uh, who for this period of, of, of civil war and, 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 and genocide was also a close uh, 
friend of mine, somebody that uh, we took each other like the brethren in, 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 in a fighting army, in a rebel army, we are always brothers and sisters. Uh, I became his chief of staff, principally his chief advisor, but literally running his office and running the country on his behalf. I was the chief technocrat uh, running the show in the country. And then at some point, I realized that we had conflicting visions of the future. And I was uh, uncomfortable continuing to serve in that kind of role. And I found out how to peacefully, diplomatically bow out of the relationship. I first met um, Kagame shortly before the uh, invasion of 1990. And I interacted with him very closely since that time, since 1991. There has been lots and lots of questions about him because he's quite intriguing. He's kind of a complex man and he evokes passions. Of course, Kagame, like many of us and like many families in Rwanda who became the victims after the 1959 revolution, he too became a refugee. All the traumatic experiences that refugees go through, he went through that. This trauma, of course, becomes part and parcel of what shapes us in responding to the trauma that he has gone through. He has also developed a very violent character that seems to prepare him to inflict a maximum violence on not only the Hutu population, but he's also extremely vicious uh, towards his fellow Tutsis. So the violent streak in Kagame uh, has been extremely, extremely harmful to the vision that this organization, the Rwandese Patriotic Front, originally had. History is not only a set of facts, but in our case, it's what we've been going through a long period of time. In speaking to figuring out how a society that has been ripped apart by conflict, how does it gather itself, each side to step into the side of, into the shoes or into the steps of the other side, because we are two ethnic groups, the Hutus and Tutsis. Uh, we, the, the, the ethnic groups are not a problem to each other. I will argue in these conversations that it's the groups that have power that tend to set these ethnic groups into conflict with each other. And so I have been trying to figure out how can we bring about healing to these really largely traumatized communities and this trauma has been going on for a long time. We are looking in this conversation, I'll be casting my eyes far back. About 125, 127 years ago, at the end of the 19th century, up to now. And I realize, if you look at that, with that kind of trajectory, that this is a society that has really suffered trauma time and time again, without catching its breath and figuring out how can we become normal how do we heal together and create a future together? For most people who have watched Rwanda, if, for example, beginning from 1994, it looks like it's, it's a long period of time, but in a nation's life, this is really like, uh, you know, like a dot. Uh, but for those who live that kind of story, it's always fresh because it's not a life that you live and then you package it and you put it in a shelf and you just move forward. I wish we could do that. And it's literally for all societies. It's not only for Rwanda. For people who watch Rwanda, it's as if they are frozen with the image of what happened in 1994, the genocide of 1994, because it was covered one of the, you know, towards the end of the 20th century, it was one of the most uh, tragic and defining moments at the end of the millennium. And it's those images, bodies floating in, uh, uh, in rivers, in lakes of that region of East and Central Africa, of, you know, gruesome uh, pictures of children, of elder people, of every age, people who perished in that genocide. Uh, but specifically, it's renowned for the killings, the genocide that affected people of my ethnic group, the, the Tutsi. What is the meaning of Hutu, Tutsi, Twa? Where do these ethnic groups derive their names? It's a mixture of, of historical 
circumstances, uh, it's partly mythology uh, about the origins, the origins of Rwanda. Often in the minds of Rwandans, it is a big country. Rwanda means something so big. Rwanda goes, uh, something so big. The indigenous people, as, as we hear from history, are the Tuas and the other people, the majority of, of, of Rwandans are Hutus and we're told in this history that they're also the second to be in that, in that country. And the third group, the Tutsis, from whom the kings were derived, imposed their rule on these indigenous populations, the Tuas and the Hutus. And we can be guarantors of each other's security, especially when we put the Hutus and Tutsis and Tuas in a larger entity that has hundreds and hundreds of ethnic groups in these other nations. <laughs> we are such a minority that we would even be more interested in being Rwandan. Because in, in the East African kind of context, you would be very happy to say, oh, I'm actually Rwandan. Because if you say I'm Tutsi, who cares about you being Tutsi or who cares about you being Hutu? So there's a social benefit that would begin to help us gather the nation. And the social, if, if we change the dynamic of Hutu, Twa, and Tutsi, it is possible that it ceases to be uh, a matter of life and death Oh, and hopefully looking at Rwandans in a different way than you look at them right now. And so I think gathering the nation within Rwanda, gathering the nation within the East and Central African region that we belong to, and creating the kind of opportunities, economic opportunities, at that much bigger level of East Africa, uh, would create, will create, I think we should speak in the affirmative that this is going to happen, that this is the trend of the future, and this is what we should be working towards. We may be three ethnic groups, the Hutus, Tuas, and Tutsis, but we're also Rwandan people. Gathering the nation is founded on the realization that over a long period of time, we are a very broken society with a lot of trauma amongst ourselves, and we've changed positions of perpetrator and victim each successive period of history. And so gathering the nation is not only getting people together physically. To gather the nation means working with our neighbors, the neighboring countries, because we've not only inflicted trauma on each other, we've also inflicted trauma on our neighbors. But of course, in order to gather ourselves, we've got to be free people. That's why freedom uh, of speech, freedom of association, freedom of organization becomes so important because only free people can make the movement towards gathering each other. It involves taking a risk, but it's a necessary risk because the alternative is perpetuating trauma uh, indefinitely. This process of gathering we are talking about, it's not even so much about my generation, although we desperately need it like every other Rwandan, but it's more about Setting that idea to the young generation because they are the ones who are going to build that gathered nation, that community with mutual interests uh, that can help heal each other, but also a community that indeed is part and parcel of the wider region, East Africa. So <laughs> it's the, really the, the young people to whom we must try and structure and continue this kind of conversation of healing, of extending the frontier of freedom, uh, of gathering each other, uh, and creating a flourishing Rwanda in which they can feel very much at ease with themselves, with each other, but also with the, with the wider region. For a society that has gone through repeated trauma, we've not come to a situation where as a society we recognize that we need to take a deep breath and position ourselves into each other's shoes to see how much pain we've inflicted on each other. And we have not been able to do that simply because the government of the day, the current government of Rwanda, 
has simply tried to impose that single narrative of saying, no, it's the Hutus who've inflicted damage. And this narrative is the one that also the international community has bought into, uh, partly because of guilt, they were not able to prevent it. But the other part of the narrative is what has happened to the other side, on the other side of the Hutus, because not every Hutu is a killer. Not every Hutu was involved in the killings that took place in 1994. And the fact of the matter is that the truth, which is the basis of healing, as I will be saying later, has been pushed under the rug, and nobody wants to recognize that the Hutus also have suffered under the hands of this uh, government. We've seen how they, these kind of uh, events can easily be hijacked by the powers of uh, of the day and often there is a complicating external factor if you look at the conditions that cause genocide don't look from outside look from within society it was the same with germany it was the same with cambodia with darfur in, in the sudan with bosnia as governor with rwanda with the armenian genocide look for what happens within the system because that's where the conditions are absolutism no freedom of press, no freedom of political expression, no freedom of association, a very heavy and overbearing state that is very intrusive goes into the lives of every other citizen. That's exactly what produced the genocide of 1994, but that is exactly what exists in Rwanda today. That's why we call it a national hostage crisis. And so the psychology of this, of this regime therefore compares us in terms of how to end it we only have to end it peacefully. It really boils down to organization, to mobilization, to networking, harnessing the power of technology that exists today. Because you can't imagine, you, you, you're going to see uh, an idea like this one that is coming out. You will see how many Rwandans and, and, and many people in the region and many people internationally who are thirsty and hungry for finding an alternative voice uh, to the dominant logic uh, in Rwanda, which is uh, state-controlled. Because we have seen that in other countries, that has happened. So in terms of social contract, therefore, it's moving beyond the kind of shapers of history that until now has been the centerpiece of uh, Rwanda's historical development. It has been kings or the colonial uh, authorities, or after independence, it has been dictatorships in the form of republics presided over by, by strong men. And so social contract means that we have to reach out and have a conversation amongst ourselves, a very risky proposal indeed, in which we have to agree on how we organize this community called Rwanda. It's about how we uh, interact with each other in terms of uh, the politics of the country, in terms of social organization, in terms of uh, how family can thrive and flourish. It's about how we deal with each other at a national level, but also at a regional level because we have the neighbors. So a social contract is about putting people at the center of this process. The young people are very much <laughs> the subject of this agenda. For the young generation, they've grown up listening especially to the standard version of Rwanda's story, I'm indeed part of this story, whether you want it or not. I've tried sometimes to run away from it, but it's a story that, uh, in which I've been an actor, and there's no way I can disengage it. The Tutsi genocide, the miracle of Rwanda's uh, transformation. If they are sons and daughters of, of Hutus, they are likely also to be listening to what their parents tell them, because that's how Rwanda's <laughs> informal education works. At the kitchen table, on the hills, uh, wherever we are in country, outside the country, this story follows us and the story we tell to our children matters a lot because the Rwanda they see is also what you tell them. Rwanda is a country, as I said, 12.5 million people, the majority of the people are rural peasants. Every family probably own, uh, will have a small patch of land on which it's a subsistence 
agricultural economy. We are in effect a pre-industrial kind of society, largely, uh, because the majority of the people live in this subsistence agricultural economy. They have a few crops, you know, uh, they have a few animals. If they are lucky, they'll be able to sell the surplus to get some, some cash for other expenses like health and education, put it alongside the modern skyline of Kigali, the capital city. So the elites who have ruled Rwanda, whether Hutu elites or Tutsi elites, uh, life, their life is mainly in the capital city. And General Kagame, who runs the country, thinks he's trying to create a Singapore out of Rwanda. Uh, and you have all these tall buildings, very modern. Uh, he's built uh, arenas for basketball. If you're a foreigner coming from the United States or, or Europe or elsewhere else, you go to Rwanda, you wouldn't miss much because everything you get in New York uh, in terms of uh, the coffees and uh, flavored water and all these types of things, you'd, you'd get them, the very expensive restaurants, you'd get them in Kigali. And so the question that we should be asking ourselves is not how much really we can sustain this life, lifestyle in the capital city because this lifestyle in the capital city is essentially a lifestyle that depend heavily depend on foreign aid so the capital city that you see in rwanda kigali that you see has largely benefited for huge funds that have been injected into the country since the genocide because remember rwanda had the benefit of doubt a lot of good in the international community. The community had done nothing to prevent genocide. They had done nothing to stop it. The regime of the day, and I used to be part of it, we did a, an excellent job of keeping this guilt on the international community in order to extract a lot of funding from the international community. From the World Bank, I, I was the first one to negotiate the first uh, concessional loan on uh, $50 million. Thereafter, Rwanda borrows heavily. So you are borrowing against the future, the, the present and the future of Rwanda on behalf of these majority peasants in subsistence economy to subsidize the life of the capital city. Uh, life is not about uh, just material living, it's also about the conditions of our culture and the spiritual dimension, the spiritual dimension, I'm not talking about religion, but the conditions of our, of our spirit. You cannot say you are developed if you have lots of money and you are so miserable that uh, you do not even wish to live. And often countries have not paid enough attention to the development paradigm that we subscribe to because very often it has been that we become like the West, now increasingly to become like China. No, every society has to become the best of itself. And the best of itself is not stuff. A good life, a well-lived life for a Rwandan is much bigger than all that. So the agency is not to become like the West or become like China or become like Europe. To become the best we can be in Rwanda, the best we can be in the region, and there are enough resources within our region. If we develop our human resources, then we can have enough resources and then borrow wisely. Because if money does not help you to develop your people, develop them in a way that is sustainable. And if it's uh, resources that enslave or hold your population and your country hostage, then you are better off without that kind of money. We've got to have our own people thinking for our own people. And so when you have a situation like this one, truth is so important because reconciliation cannot take place without this truth telling. Now, memory in Rwanda is exclusively a Tutsi affair. Not a single Hutu would be allowed to remember their dead. Remember they have their dead who were killed by, by the RPF uh, during the civil war. There are those who are killed after RPF came into power. There are those who are killed who, uh, in, uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And since then, there is repeated killings that take place. And none of that has been documented. 
none of that has been acknowledged and none of the Hutu community are allowed actually to remember. And every April 7th, and for that week and for that month, Tutsis remember. Hutus cannot remember. If you cannot go beyond that hurdle, how then can you talk about reconciliation and healing? It's not possible. You cannot be selective in what you remember and what you do not remember. Because people remember their own. You cannot decree, legislate, uh, or make an order against people remembering their own. Each of us always remembers who they lost. Now imagine who's, those whose lives are taken away by the state or those affiliated with the state. How should they feel? How can they not remember? So the, the, making sure that the, the, the Hutus are allowed to remember, making sure that that chapter is revisited to make sure that we know who is responsible for killing, bringing them to account is very important. But most importantly, remembering and remembering together is what creates a nation. So here we are, we say a call to action and we've explained why we need to go beyond what we've always done because what we've always done has not brought us to the fulfillment of the aspirations of all the Rwandan people. We are calling people to freedom. We are calling people to healing, to flourishing, to be co-creators of prosperity, not the kind of prosperity that is sham and superficial, that only seems to benefit the people who are in power, but the kind of prosperity that is both equitable and also sustainable because only Rwandan people can rebuild Rwanda with the support of the region, with the support of Africa, and the support of the international community. And in doing that, we fully understand that we cannot wait for tomorrow. This is not work that you say we shall do it tomorrow. It's the job of today, of here and now, but most importantly, it's the job of Rwandan people. Because whatever we do today affects the next generation of Rwandans.